Welcome to the uh, first of two sessions of the Carl Jasper Society of North America taking place at the 93rd Pacific Division APA meetings in Vancouver. Before we begin, um, we would like to acknowledge that this session is taking place on the unceded traditional territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil First Nations. This acknowledgement is a reminder of the responsibilities that we have as guests in this space. The Carl Jasper Society, known as the KJSNA, was founded in 1980 to promote study and research with regard to the ideas of Carl Jaspers and related issues in continental philosophy, politics, and the arts. Every year since 1980, the KJSNA has conducted its annual meetings in conjunction with the APA divisional meetings. Since 2005, selected papers of these meetings are published in an online open source journal called Existence. Our first speaker is Dr. Kiki Barrick an associate professor from Southern New Hampshire University. She received her PhD in philosophy from VU, VU University Amsterdam in 2010. Dr. Barrick's current research interests include value theory, analytic existentialism, and the philosophy of death. Dr. Barrick's pr presentation is titled, Jaspers on Death. Thank you. Death is a popular topic in contemporary analytic philosophy, especially in analytic metaphysics and so-called analytic existentialism. Questions about death in this literature include what happens when we die, whether it is bad to die, and whether we should want to live forever. Unfortunately, this literature rarely engages the work of true existentialist philosophers like Sartre, Camus, Beauvoir, Heidegger, and Jaspers. The main reason for this lack of engagement is that the writings of these continental philosophers are notoriously obscure. In this paper, I try to remedy some of this lack of engagement by analyzing Jasper's philosophy of death from an analytic perspective, so providing an accessible reading without jargon, and connecting it to the main debates in analytic existentialism. In the process of doing so, I will draw connections to other philosophers' work on death and raise some critical questions about Jasper's philosophy of death that present themselves on an analytic reading of the text. My hopes are twofold. One, that Jasper's ideas on death can be clarified by using some distinctions made in analytic philosophy. And two, that this engagement will serve as a foundation for exploring how analytic existentialism can be enriched by Jasper's philosophy of death. Here's how this paper is set up. In the first section, I will explain why and in which sense death plays a central role in Jasper's existence philosophy. Jasper thinks that it is not so much the fact that we die as confronting our own mortality that is existentially significant. Confronting our mortality is existentially significant because it gives rise to existential angst, and how we respond to existential angst determines whether or not we might realize our full potential. One response to existential angst is to try to avoid it, which can take different forms. I will discuss this response in the second section of the paper. However, avoiding existential angst comes at a steep price because it is only when we face up to death with courage that we can realize our potential and live authentically. This is the focus of the third section of this paper. Death, then, for Jaspers is ultimately a test, and confronting our mortality provides a unique and crucial opportunity to become who we have the potential to be. Finally, in the last section of the paper, I will connect Jasper's philosophy of death to the analytic debate and point to the ideas that I think have the most potential for enriching it. For Jasper's, there is a sense in which death is existentially significant and a sense in which it is not. For the objective self, and this is the term I will use for Dasein or existence or mere existence or empirical existence, so this self is a concrete physical and sociological being. For that self, death is not existentially significant. That being said, the objective self's finitude can give rise to a boundary situation, which can make death existentially significant for the existential self. And that is the term that I will use for existence or self-being or the ineffable inner core of the individual. So for the non-empirical, non-objective dimension of a human being. So let's explore this distinction in more detail between it being existentially significant and not being existentially significant. For the objective self, death is an objective and general fact. We are all going to die, and death is the end of our phenomenal, practical existence in the world. Finitude is a fundamental feature of the objective self. 
We are finite biological beings with a limited lifespan. As an objective limit to our existence, death is not existentially significant. After all, the objective self can never experience its own death. As Freud said, we cannot even imagine our own deaths. And instead, we experience ourselves as endless. Death is simply the time when the curtain drops and experience stops. And this view is reminiscent of Sartre in being and nothingness. Sartre has a similar view on death. Death is merely a limit to our experience. He says it's a door to nothingness or to the non-human. And as such, it doesn't have existential or, or subjective significance. Sartre says, and I quote, since death is always beyond my subjectivity, there is no place for it in my subjectivity, end quote. In Being a Nothingness, Sartre argues very strongly, though not explicitly, against Heidegger's view that death is existentially significant. But for Jaspers, there is more to the story. And as we will see, his view is ultimately much closer to Heidegger's than to Sartre. For Jaspers, we do not just exist as an objective self, but we are also potentially an existential self. As opposed to the objective self, the existential self is infinite, but aware of the objective self's finitude. When confronted with death, our own or someone else's, a boundary situation can occur. In this boundary situation, the existential self becomes fully aware of death, which can give rise to existential angst. This experience so of the boundary situation in Jasper's terms, or of grappling with the thoughts and feelings that our mortality can evoke, that is what is existentially significant for the existential self, rather than the mere fact that we are going to die. What makes the boundary situation so existentially significant? The existential significance of the boundary situation consists in the unique opportunity it prov provides. Facing up to it with courage is the only way for us to realize our existential self and our authenticity. And I'll discuss this more later, but first let's turn to the other way one can respond to the boundary situation, which is to try to avoid existential angst and, and fail the test. So avoiding existential angst. How we respond to existential angst is crucial for Jaspers. But what is existential angst? From the outset, it is important to distinguish existential angst from fear of dying. Unlike fear of dying, existential angst does not have a concrete object, such as the pain that dying may involve. Rather, it is the horror of non-being, as Jaspers calls it, or as Beauvoir calls it, the horror of anni annihilation. Peach describes Jasper's concept of existential angst as fear of sinking into nothingness. Existential angst can cause feelings of loneliness, helplessness, and despair. And this is why phasing up to existential angst requires courage, and this is also why many people try to avoid it. Jasper's discussion of the ways in which many of us try to avoid existential angst provides great insight in how Jasper thinks we ought not deal with our mortality. So let's consider how we should not live before we see how Jaspers thinks that we ought to live with death. The first way to avoid existential angst is by immersing ourselves in the objective self. This means clinging entirely to worldly phenomena and taking them as endless and absolute instead of finite, transitory, and insignificant. Or in other words, it means to focus entirely on worldly pleasures and worldly activities. Jaspers calls this losing ourselves in appearance, and he thinks that it will lead to a hunger for life and to jealousy, pride, ambition, and fear. We can try to avoid existential angst this way, and I think Jaspers' observation is keen because this is what many people in fact do, but it means foregoing our possible existential self and giving up on the possibility of living an authentic life, and that is obviously a high price to pay. The second way, to avoid existential angst um, can be seen as a flip side of the first. We could try to ignore the objective self's needs and focus entirely on the transcendental realm as mystics do. However, Jaspers thinks that this other extreme is also an evasion of existential angst. As Peach explains, and this is a quote, Jaspers repeatedly claims possible existence has an antonymic relationship with the world. It cannot be separated from it, nor can it be entirely unified with it, 
In other words, existence is in a dialectical relationship between the empirical and the transcendental realm, and the balance between the two must be maintained." End quote. It's worth pointing out that Thomas Nagel makes a similar distinction between being, being fully immersed in our own lives from our own points of view, like animals are, and assuming a transcendental point of view, like mystics do. And he argues, like Jaspers, that it is impossible to give up either and that it is uniquely human to be able to take up both points of view in the first place. So I thought that was an interesting connection. A third way to avoid existential angst is by changing the boundary situation into something different so that it ceases to be a true boundary situation. As Jaspers puts it, this will transform the meaning of death as a boundary. And Jaspers dis discusses two different ways of doing so, by employing logic or by adopting a belief in an afterlife. So let's discuss each in turn. Employing logic should here not be understood as solving formal logic problems, but as rational reasoning about death. Without an explicit reference, Jaspers discusses Epicurus' strategy for alleviating fear of death. Epicurus famously said, when death is here, I am not. When I am here, death is not. And his point was that even though it is natural, fear of death is not rational because we will never experience death. And after we die, we won't have any experiences at all any experiences at all, no good ones, but no bad ones either. As many others do, Jaspers thinks that though logically sound, Epicurus's argument does not do much to combat existential angst. It is hard to pinpoint exactly where Epicurus goes wrong if he does, but at the same time, his argument does not take away the fear of death. As Jaspers writes, and I quote, they, uh, which are the logical thoughts, seem to look death in the eye, but in effect, they make me only more oblivious of, its, oblivious of its essence. They ignore that there are things to be finished, that I am not through, that I still have to make amends. Above all, that time and time again, I am filled with a sense of being as mere existence, which becomes pointless when I think of an absolute end." End quote. This third strategy is not so much a way we ought not live, as the first and second one are, but rather one that Jaspers considers ineffective. The fourth way to avoid existential angst is just like the third, aimed at transforming the boundary situation into something else. This strategy is to adopt a belief in an afterlife. If one believes in an afterlife, death ceases to be the end, and the boundary situation ceases to be a genuine boundary situation. Jaspers writes, death has been conquered at the cost of losing the boundary situation. This gets rid of existential angst, but like the first strategy, it also gets rid of the opportunity for authenticity and selfhood. Jaspers' presentation of belief in an afterlife to avoid existential angst reveals that he views belief in an afterlife merely as a coping mechanism and an inauthentic one to boot. Indeed, Jaspers thinks that there is no evidence for the existence of an afterlife. Instead, he thinks that there is evidence that we do not survive death. And he says, mortality can be proven. Jaspers therefore thinks that belief in an afterlife is a form of self-deception. Regardless of whether, whether one agrees or disagrees with Jaspers here, this does raise a host of interesting questions. Is death only existentially significant if there is no afterlife? If one believes in an afterlife for good reasons, if that's possible, then is it not possible to experience the boundary situation of death? And does this mean that religious people, or at least those who believe in an afterlife, do not have the opportunity to live authentically and to realize the existential self? As a side note, Jaspers interestingly believes in a form of deathlessness, yet this is not a traditional afterlife or a form of immortality, but rather the idea that one can experience eternity in a moment. So it's not, it's, it's not really the same idea of an after, as an afterlife. For Jaspers, grappling with our mortality is so existentially significant or valuable that it plays a crucial role in his existence philosophy. This raises the question what exactly this significance consists in. That is, what is the value of confronting our mortality? For Jaspers, confronting our mortality has instrumental rather than intrinsic value. Facing up to death with courage enables the existential self to live authentically and to realize selfhood and personhood. This makes the similarities between Jaspers and Heidegger apparent. Heidegger, too, 
um, thinks that being towards death enables one to live authentically. Jasper's account of facing up to the boundary situation with courage and thereby achieving selfhood raises a number of questions. Peach mentions some of these questions, and I quote, what exactly does it mean to face up to a boundary situation or to live or experience it? Is it sufficient to reflect on it or is the term living used in a more specific sense? Can any, anybody be said to be in a boundary situation in order to, um, without facing up to it? End quote. Another important question is whether it is necessary to experience a boundary, boundary situation in order to achieve authenticity, or if it is merely one possible way. Could a different boundary situation, such as suffering or guilt, have the same effect? The answer to this question is not entirely clear, but Jaspers does say that the crucial boundary situation is my death. That's a quote. He seems to suggest that when con one cannot become an existential self without death. And he says, and I quote, if there were no disappearance, which I think should be understood as death, my being would be endless duration rather than existence. In addition, Jaspers believes in the primacy of lived experience for authentic knowledge, so it would make sense that experiencing the boundary situation of death is necessary to gain the instrumental value associated with it. And Peach also seems to think that confronting our mortality with courage is a necessary condition for authenticity. She writes, existential angst is the gateway to authentic existence. And also, she writes, there would be no selfhood without the finitude of life and having to come to terms with it, end quote. Jasper's philosophy of death takes a different approach from most current work in analytic existentialism, which focuses primarily on answering the following four questions. Is death bad? Should we fear death? What happens when we die, and should we want to live forever? Even though Jaspers does not explicitly address these questions, his answers to them can be inferred from our previous analysis of his philosophy of death. Even though he speaks of the horror of non-being, Jaspers clearly thinks that ultimately, death is not bad. After all, it's only through awareness of our mortality that we can achieve authenticity and become our true selves. As we have seen, existential angst plays a crucial role in his philosophy of death. So Jaspers would say that in fact, we should fear death and avoiding fear of death leads to various ways of living inauthentically. Although fear of death and existential angst might have to be um, distinguished. It is clear from Jaspers' work that he thinks that death is the end and that believing in an afterlife is a way to avoid existential angst. Finally, because Jaspers does not think that death is bad, it seems unlikely that he thinks that we should want to live forever. My aim in this paper has been to provide an accessible account of Jaspers that opens up his philosophy to analytic philosophers. This approach raises, raises a number of questions about Jaspers' philosophy of death, but it can also be clearly seen how his philosophy of death weighs in on the main debates in analytic philosophy. My hope is that this will make Jaspers relevant to analytic existentialism and open up his work um, for future exploration. In my mind, the following two ideas in particular have potential to enrich the analytic debate. First, lived experience plays a crucial role for Jaspers and is virtually missing from analytic existentialism. So the concept of, concept of existential angst or the idea that death is a test received no attention in the analytic debate. In general, the focus is not on awareness of our mortality or crises that death can induce or how to live given that we are going to die. It's worth exploring whether something important is left, left out on a purely theoretical approach like the analytic one that does not take all these different things into consideration. And second and my last point is that a hotly debated question in the analytic debate is whether death is necessary for a meaningful life Yet there is no discussion uh, of the parallel question whether death is necessary for an authentic life. And I think that this is a question the analytic debate ought to take up. Thank you. That will begin a five minute discussion period, question and answers. We'll open up to the panel, <coughs> excuse me, open up to the panelists first. Analytic existentialism. Uh, what is? It? I'm, isn't that a kind of oxymoron? 
Thank you. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so Benatar coins that term analytic existentialism in one of his volumes. I think it's um, Life, Death, and Meaning. It's an anthology. Um, and he coins that term. And the idea is that it's um, analytic philosophy, right, with all the, the values and methodology of analytic philosophy that discusses themes that are discussed in existentialism, such as the meaning of life and death and absurdity and well, I guess authenticity isn't really discussed. But these types of questions, mostly about life, uh, the meaning of life and death, um, that in analytic philosophy um, weren't really discussed as much um, until recently. There's really been a revival of philosophy of death and of the meaning of life. So it's analytic philosophy about existentialist theme. I mean, I don't want to press this too much, but um, yeah. You seem to be working under the assumption that the methodology of analytic philosophy is more careful, more scrupulous, uh, makes better distinctions and all of that. And maybe that's so, but another question is, uh, are those distinctions, scruples and such ones that can preserve the insights that are supposedly to be had in existentialism? Thank you. Uh, yes, and so that's, I think that's a very good question, right? And that's something that, that in my conclusion I touch on a little bit. So for example, lived experience, like that is really not something that's discussed in analytic existentialism or analytic philosophy at all. Um, and so that's something that I think, right, is maybe something of value that should inform the, the discussion way more than, than it currently does. Um, I think that would be possible though even if it isn't um, done yet. And I certainly think it would be possible to talk about these topics that really have to do with how we live our lives in a clear and systematic way that analytic philosophy um, likes to promote or how they like to approach things. So I definitely think there's no contradiction just in, in trying to um, do philosophy in a clear and systematic way, but still talk about topics that actually are very substantial and that um, it, that have to do with how we live our lives, um, right? And I think that's sort of like behind this movement too that um, analytic philosophy doesn't necessarily just have to be um, sort of very abstract theoretical conceptual analysis that has nothing to do with these sort of more existentialist themes. So you uh, mentioned that uh, um, Jaspers, well he doesn't mention Epicurus, but he seems to reject the Epicurean view um, of the badness of death, and I'm wondering, so uh, would you, was he a deprivationist then? So he says, he says something like that, that he thinks that um, we still have things to do, and so that's why even, even if death ends our, all of our experiences, still there are things that I will be missing out on. So is he a deprivationist then about the badness of death, or not? I don't think so, because I don't think that he thinks that death is bad. And so, right, a deprivationist would think death is bad because, um, right, of what you miss out on after you die rather than the fact that death would be bad, right? That's their response to Epicurus. Um, and so I think that actually he doesn't think that death is bad. Um, so I think he's just trying to make the point that, that Epicurus' strategy just doesn't work because, and I think that's like many people have that intuition, right? That even though, yeah, it's true that you're not there after you die, uh, well, that doesn't take away all the problems we have with death such as that maybe, right? I think his point is rather that um, when death comes and it comes at usually not a time of your choosing that you're not ready for it, right? And so it, it terminates your life. He also makes a big point, which I didn't really touch on in this paper, but he makes a big point that is similar to Sartre, um, who says that death never completes your life, but it always terminates your life in the middle of it. Um, so Jaspers talks about that too. And so I think that quote here, he's saying, like he's talking about that aspect of life, that it, or of death rather, that it's unexpected and you're, you're not often ready for it. So it cuts off your life. Thanks, Dr. Burke. Our second speaker is uh, Dr. Pierre Keller, an associate professor in philosophy from the University of California, Riverside. Dr. Keller received his PhD in philosophy from Columbia University in 1991. His research interests focused on Kant, 19th century philosophy, and phenomenology. He's the author of several books, uh, the first one being Husserl, Heidegger, and the Human Experience, and the second one being Kant and the Demands of Self-Consciousness. 
Dr. Keller recently published a number, number of articles on Kant, Heidegger, Hegel, and Kassirer. Uh, and he's currently working on two books. One book is on Kassirer and the 20th century philosophy dealing with the parting of ways between analytic and continental philosophy, apt for the previous conversation. Uh, and the other book is on Kant and Hegel, which develops the systematic significance of the Copernican revolution and its relation to the constitutional cosmopolitan conception. Dr. Keller's interests in Jaspers is longstanding and will also be reflected in those two books. In addition, he is beginning a separate book on the Copernican Cosmopolitan Revolution in which Jaspers will feature importantly. The title of his presentation is The Kantian Constitutional Patriotism and Kant's uh, Cosmopolitan Copernican Revolution. Okay, yeah, I, I should admit that I've been working on this book with Eric uh, wreck on the origins of the analytic um, uh, divide uh, uh, the, where uh, the parting of the ways came and it's part of our contention that uh, their fundamental methodological um, uh, assumptions that are made by analytic philosophy from its inception that uh, hinder it from understanding certain things. That was a question that I raised in all honesty out of my sense that analytic philosophy, because of its fundamental grounding assumptions, has difficulty dealing with classical philosophical texts, beginning with Kant. Uh, and uh, going through Jaspers and Heidegger and Hegel and so forth. That doesn't mean there isn't an analytic version of all of those things, but it winds up uh, being, I think, uh, rather a fragmentary enterprise. Okay, so I want to look at, in this talk, uh, the Copernican Revolution uh, from the vantage point uh, both of its manifestation in one of Kant's last works, The Conflict of the Faculties, which is generally little known and little read, uh, and also the way that has had an impact especially on Karl Jaspers, but also importantly on Ernst Kassirer, uh, Martin Heidegger, and a number of contemporary French philosophers. Now, to do the whole thing is impossible today, but I'm going to give you some general uh, pointers. So uh, the first thing I want to start with is um, a revision in your conception of the Copernican Revolution. So my view is that the Copernican Revolution in Kant is almost universally misunderstood in a fundamental way. Its connection with uh, Copernicus is also almost completely misunderstood. And uh, so the result is philosophical triviality. Now, uh, if one looks at uh, Copernicus, one discovers that the way he himself sees his revolution relative to uh, Ptolemy is that he sees uh, his revolution in the ability of his model to systematically track the relations between the planets, the stars, the sun, and in relation to a moving Earth. And what he highlights is that what pre-Copernican astronomy lacked was a truly systematic conception. It was as if you had long arms, legs, um, uh, all finely described, but they don't fit together to make a hu true human being. They're a monster rather than a man. That's pretty much a paraphrase of Copernicus. Now, uh, Kassir explicitly picks up on uh, this idea, and it frames his uh, understanding of the Copernican revolution in Kant, and I think rightly so. So Kant's uh, position is to be understood as uh, laying out a new way of understanding being. This is the way um, Kassir understands it. Ten years before a being and time, Kassir 
argues that Kant's Copernican revolution raises the question of the meaning of being and addresses it in terms of the systematicity of the relations that give significance to things. And Kassir takes over uh, this conception then from Kant. I would argue that that too is uh, behind the scenes operating in Karl Jaspers conception though less explicitly. Okay, now uh, in fact I think this comes very close to a fundamental distinction between analytic philosophy and continental philosophy. So analytic philosophy uh, has the project of decomposing things into their constituents. And uh, continental philosophy from the get-go thinks that the significance of things is only to be understood in terms of their differential dynamic relations to a whole. Now, any phenomenon that is inherently holistic and dynamic will uh, suffer under the methods uh, of analytic philosophy. And I can trace that back to the founding fathers of analytic philosophy. So I'm not even saying things that are controversial here. OK, now, uh, this poses, I think, problems for the interpretations of all classical texts, because if you're convinced that classical texts, including especially Kant, must reduce to certain constituents, say, sense data or uh, representations understood in methodological isolation, as Carnap puts it in methodologically solipsistic terms, then you'll have uh, a, a great difficulty understanding the Copernican revolution as the German idealists, as uh, Kassira, and as Jaspers understand it, where you don't start from a methodologically isolated individual. Instead, you start from a conception of the way that individual is embedded in the cosmos as a whole, in history, in space, and time. And that's a conception that actually goes back to uh, Copernicus, that uh, we're not to understand ourselves in isolation as uh, participants in the cosmic order, but that gives us a new sense of our moral uh, values. This, too, is something that Kant picks up, that uh, in looking at ourselves from the cosmic perspective, we uh, approach what matters to us in a completely new way. Now, this is actually a, a key point for the structure of the university, as Kant understands it, for the uh, argument of the conflict of the faculties. In the conflict of the faculties, Kant argues that we can know the structure of the university a priori based on this systematic conception, even though uh, the university is something that has arisen under contingent circumstances. The reason we can know this structure a priori, according to Kant, is that it's governed by the way in which which the interests of the different uh, faculties and their relation to the public at large and their relation to the government are so organized that each is uh, arguably with the exception of the lower faculty, the faculty of philosophy, each is concerned with a conception of the good that it defines in its narrow self-interested terms, and each competes with the other to further that conception and its own self-interest. And even the people, in Kant's rather cynical way of looking at things, are only concerned with furthering their own self-interest. Now, what emerges out of this, though, is the philosophical faculty and philosophers as uh, individuals who are uniquely called to stand up for the truth against the interests of the uh, uh, specific professional schools and against the state. 
And Kant appeals in this context to the autonomy of reason, but also to the autonomy of the university. That the autonomy of the university is only established by the appeal of the philosophical faculty to the autonomy of public reason. And that autonomy of public reason manifests itself in the ability of the philosophical faculty to see through the apparent good of the faculty of religion, the faculty of law, the faculty of medicine. So how does the philosopher do that? Now, Kant points especially to a conception that the philosopher forms of the world in non Ptolemaic uh, terms, in Copernican terms, he explicitly r references people who fall back on the views of Tycho Brahe as the opposing view. So his idea is the philosopher is able to uh, grasp the truth that is merely apparent to the political leaders, to the different faculties, uh, by looking at their competing interests and then weighing those competing interests against the significance of things as they reveal themselves through public discussion of everything that matters. So that's why the philosophical faculty is committed to the public use of reason in public discussion. And this already goes back to the first uh, edition uh, preface to the critique of pure reason. So this is not a new idea of Kant. It structures the whole critique of pure reason from beginning to end. From beginning to end, Kant has the idea that the significance of things is only to be understood if we can understand how everything uh, can uh, come together to make sense of our differential interest in the respective positions that we occupy in a whole. And that's the way he conceives the structure of the university. That's the way he conceives the structure of the intellectual in the university. And that's why Jaspers, Heidegger in a maybe awful way, uh, but Kassir in a really courageous way, and uh, recent French philosophers have always turned to the um, uh, conflict of the faculties, and it's pointing to the French Revolution as this event that utterly changes history and shows us the, the way in which uh, we can trace a path through history in which we relate to the university and the state in terms of a constitution in which individuals are uh, relating to each other in terms that restrict their freedom only when that freedom is required in order for a like amount of freedom to be present for everybody. So Kant's constitutional patriotism actually structures the whole critique of pure reason. It, it's announced at the beginning of the section of ideas when he points to Plato's Republic as the ideal of a free republic. And it's taken up then again in the doctrine of method where Kant returns to this idea and argues that that free republic can only be possible if the free public expression of ideas is something that is encouraged. And that, again, is the underlying theme of the conflict of the faculties, that there will be a necessary conflict of the faculties because the particular faculties are concerned with a particular interest and welfare. And that comes up against the concern that philosophers and the philosophical faculty, the learned who care about the truth, have to have in being concerned about the truth and how it matters to us in our lives. So this isn't an isolated truth. This is the truth not understood, as Kant puts it, from the vantage point of the scholastic conception of philosophy, but understood from the vantage point of how the scholastic picture of things can be integrated 
into a comprehensive conception of what matters to us from the vantage point that we occupy here and now. And it's in that sense that I take uh, Kant to be almost in every respect the if you want proto-existentialist, uh, there is hardly a single doctrine that's identified contrastively with existential thought, which you don't actually already find in Kant. And that's not a, a point that Karl Jaspers would have argued with me about. For one thing that Karl Jaspers and Martin Heidegger had in common when they were friends was that they thought the cosmopolitan conception of philosophy was the fundamental one, and that that was the fundamental uh, conception in Kant. And that idea, I think, they had from Ernst Cassir, who had argued that for decades, from the early 1908 uh, onward, to his defense at the, as the Weimar Republic was in his death now, his defense of the, uh, the revolution and the republic against the forces of darkness. He stood up and said, look, the idea of freedom, the idea of democracy is not an idea that's alien to Germany. The idea of a republic, the idea of natural rights, this is not a, an idea that's alien to Germany, as you proclaim when you say that our thought, the thought of the Marburg School, is the thought of Jewish thinkers who are alien to Germany. No, this thought is the underlying theme of German philosophy from Leibniz to Kant to um, Hegel. Uh, Okay, uh, so I subscribe actually to all of that, and I find I'm able on that basis to put, provide the kind of uh, discriminating and comprehensive reading of Kant that uh, analytic interpretations just can't offer because of their grounding assumptions. And then we'll move on to a question period, first to the panelists, and then we'll do the audience. Could you tell us again then, so what are the grounding assumptions of analytic philosophy so that they, um, so when I teach uh, 20th century philosophy to my students at, uh, at college, I say that analytic philosophers care about things like clarity, argumentation, they value science, uh, they value common sense, they want to give arguments. It's these kinds of things that make analytic philosophy what it is, not that they are committed to breaking things down into their, into their parts. No, no, there are some that too, so you oh. need the microphone. <laughs> so, so the question is, so, um, so why is that? Well, is that not what analytic philosophy is? Um, and if it's not, then, then what is it? OK, so uh, it, analytic philosophers offer certain interpretations of what these things are, what clarity is, what an argument is. And those assumptions about these things are actually where they reveal their assumptions. So what is an argument? Uh, analytic philosophers look in philosophical texts like those of Kant desperately to find the kinds of arguments that they think are important. Uh, what is the model of an argument? A couple of propositions and a conclusion. Unfortunately, that isn't actually an argument because, and this is actually the conception that is under dis dispute between, say, the Marburg school of neo-Kantianism and its conception of logic and Russell uh, at the same time. So what is the, why isn't that an argument? Because the significance of the proposition isn't self-presenting. Uh, you can only understand those as a proposition in the space of a complex of contract. You simply presuppose it and then you take that isolated item as self-found. That's uh, the myth of a given, to use a phrase of Wilfred Sellers, and it's a grounding assumption of most of analytic philosophy. When you're looking for clarity, you're looking, how do I break this down into something I can isolate from its context? But that's not clarifying unless you already understand what the context is. You're helping yourself to the so uh, that's why stuff seems clear to analytic philosophers that isn't clear to other now look I love modal logic and stuff 
But the first time that I read the works of uh, famous modal logicians uh, like Kripke, it did not at all seem clear to me. And it still doesn't seem clear to me. It only seems clear if you start with certain assumptions. And I say the same thing about continental philosophy. You find that uh, uh, Kant isn't clear? A lot, maybe, but I mean, uh, uh, maybe you're thinking Jaspers or Heidegger. Great, that's very helpful. Uh, thank you. Uh, one follow-up question. Sure. So then people like me, and I think like Dr. Berg as well, who are interested in sort of bridging this divide, I guess, would you say then that there's just that it's an impossible project so for someone to try to bridge this divide? Um, I mean, I know that I thought talking about the divide was actually passe, and now we're, we're past that. But now it seems like, it seems like you're saying, no, there is a divide, and it's, it's, uh, it can't be passed. Uh, well, no, look, I, I'm not trying to devalue what you're doing. I do think, however, that there's a, an assumption that you're working with, uh, which well, we is, all have assumptions. Yeah. Sure, yeah, and I'm not denying that, right? Uh, uh, um, uh, but the assumption that you've been working with, uh, and it's pretty clear in your presentation, is that somehow analytic philosophy is clear on all of these things, so we have to bring this kind of a help to continental philosophy. Well, from my point of view, continental philosophy doesn't need that help because it's not less clear. What it is is more comprehensive and more systematic. So it's not less systematic. We're not bringing systematicity. When you're looking at things in isolation and chopping them up and not looking at the, their context and taking everything as if you could understand it in isolation, then uh, that's fine for certain purposes. But I tend to think with Whitehead that that involves a lot of the fallacy of misplaced concretion. When you take an abstraction, perfectly legitimate in its own right, and then you take it as something concrete. So based on that, then why not just say that analytic philosophy, kind of in the spirit of Jaspers, right? So Jaspers is breaking into just different perspectives on what truth is. Why not highlight maybe that analytic philosophy is just limited? So like as Josh was just saying a moment ago, so assumptions, of course, but bringing assumptions to the text, but why not just say that it's limited and here's some areas where it, it can maybe add another perspective, another way of looking at this problem and then we can continue to integrate or synthesize on the more lived experience side of how these different ways can actually come together or come apart. Go ahead. Okay, so my view is after 20 or 30 years of reflection on this that the, the grounding assumptions of analytic philosophy are such that they're incapable of dealing with the true diversity of things. I mean, what Quine takes as his model the idea of objects that you can quantify over. If that's your model of understanding things, then you've got to throw out huge amounts of stuff. So the argument I'm making is not against science. So the philosophers that I respect, like Kassir, are as keen on uh, the details of quantum mechanics and special and general relativity as any analytic philosopher. And it's a very care, uh, selective list of people who are supposed to be analytic philosophers who have no interest, as it were, in these other things. Look at one of the greatest mathematicians of the century, Hermann Weyl who made seminal contributions to general relativity, too, or Gödel, or, and I can go uh, down the list. These are not people with, uh, who share the uh, grounding assumptions of analytic philosophy. It's very explicit. They're wor worry, uh, they, they find interesting uh, contributions from people like Brauer and Kassir and so on. I'm just pushing back against the idea, which I think is completely wrong, that continental philosophers have been less oriented or interested in science. That's just not true. What they've been less oriented to is a certain positivistic conception of science, which I think is 
completely inadequate to understanding logic, physics, or mathematics. Anyway, so, you know, if you want to take up Carnap's views and Schlick's, I'd be happy to debate, or Quine. It's only by a sort of uh, faith in this stuff that you can think that that's philosophically superior. All right, thank you. Let's uh, thank Dr. Keller. Our third speaker uh, tonight is uh, Dr. Devin Zane Shaw, a professor in the Department of Philosophy and Humanities at Douglas College in Canada. Uh, Dr. Shaw received his PhD in philosophy uh, from the University of Ottawa in 2009. He has a variety of research interests, including uh, continental philosophy, existentialism, and political theory. He's the author of several books, uh, one titled Egalitarian Moments from Descartes to Rancière, and the other book being Freedom and Nature in Schelling's Philosophy of Art. Dr. Shaw has also published a variety, of, a variety of articles ranging on topics from Descartes to Sartre, and he's currently writing a book about Jacques Rancière, uh, Simone de Beauvoir, and anti-fascism. Furthermore, his long-term project, called Unsettling Existentialism, involves rethinking the work of Sartre, Beauvoir, and other existentialists through the lens of anti-colonial and decolonial, that is, Africana, Creole, and indigenous frameworks. The title of Dr. Shaw's presentation is Unsettling Jaspers, Historicizing Metaphysical Guilt. Thank you. Um, so today, what am I going to talk about? Um, as you know, the bio sort of presented there, uh, in my recent work, and now we're getting very recent, uh, I've been looking at the post-war writings of European anti-fascist philosophers. So this is like in the last couple, this is really coming to fruition in the last couple months is a big picture of Beauvoir, Ranci, and Sartre. Um, so recently, for instance, and it'll inflect this, is that I've analyzed Sartre's anti-Semite and Jew and Beauvoir's ethics of ambiguity to assess how we might fight back against the rise of the far right and fascism in North America. At the same time, I found it necessary to consider these figures of continental philosophy within the context that we experience them as, as North Americans um, in settler colonial societies. Um, I believe drawing on a line of anti-fascist and anti-colonial authors uh, that, work at, that look at anti-fascism, anti-racism, and anti-colonialism, uh, that anti-fascism entails decolonization for, as Jay Sakai once noted, quote, white settler colonialism and fascism occupy the same ecological niche, end quote. It's in this framework that I'm going to approach Jasper's essay, The Question of German Guilt. There, and so this is the Jasper Society, so I don't actually spend a lot of time talking about Jaspers because that's what I'm going to presume you're familiar with. I'm going to spend my time talking about the, another, the historicizing side, I suppose. Um, I'm going to look at that book briefly. Uh, there, Jaspers distinguishes between four concepts of guilt, criminal guilt, political guilt, moral guilt, and metaphysical guilt. And at the outset, when I was invited to come give this talk, I assume that I could read Jaspers in parallel with a well-known essay in the field of indigenous political thought um, and settler, colonialist, uh, settler colonial studies by Eve Tuck and K. Wayne Yang called Decolonization is Not a Metaphor. There, in that essay, they analyze a number of what they call settler moves to innocence. So I'm just going to use a quote from that. Quote, Settler moves to innocence are those strategies or positionings that attempt to relieve the settler of feelings of guilt or responsibility without giving up land or power or privilege, without having to change much at all, end quote. Settlers, and let's be clear here, I'm a settler, so um, I'm of European descent and some various other places, actually. My family's history is kind of fascinating in some ways, but I'm still a white settler in that regard. So settlers, for example, might claim a real or imagined indigenous ancestor to mitigate feelings uh, of responsibility for on the ongoing settler colonial oppression and dispossession of indigenous peoples. My own family, for instance, has a story about an ancestor, and it does something along the lines of try to position my family as having some kind of roots to belonging in North America um, other than being settlers. Well, and remember, real or imagined. So it's what that story does as a narrative for why my family is doing a certain thing in the settler colonial context. And so settler moves to innocence, I thought. You know, these wouldn't be too far different from a discussion that we would say, like, for instance, that Sartre and Beauvoir would talk about bad faith. And in fact, there's a discussion in Jaspers about how people can misuse the concepts of guilt, in fact, 
to uh, mitigate their own guilt or their own feelings of responsibility for situation. So this is the one side where I think there's a lot of really interesting connections. Um, so Jasper's, for example, examines how the distinction between the four concepts of guilt can be, quote, speciously used to get rid of the whole guilt question, end quote. For example, when evaluating moral guilt, a German who lived through the Third Reich could use Jasper's appeal to conscience to absolve himself of guilt by reasoning that, quote, I hear that my conscience alone has jurisdiction. Others have no right to accuse me. There's your move, right? Well, I'm still doing the quote here. Well, my conscience is not going to be too hard on me. It wasn't really so bad. Let's forget about it and make a fresh start, end quote. Here, indeed, we have a parallel with the kind of thing that would happen in the sense that one of the moves to innocence that Tuck and Yang discuss is the idea that settler colonialism happened in the past and we can just make a fresh start and everything's fine. So there are very interesting parallels in these kinds of discussions that I think can be very fruitful with Jaspers. There are some limits, and that's what I'm going to spend most of my time talking about, because I think that's actually what's really interesting and puts Jaspers' work to the test. Rather than just going, yeah, well, I'm glad they all work out. Let's, you know, throw it at the wall and see, you know, what happens here. So I'd also considered how we might understand the concept of metaphysical <laughs> guilt in light of settler colonialism. Jaspers defines metaphysical guilt by saying, quote, there exists a solidarity among men as human beings that makes each co-responsible for every wrong and every injustice in the world, especially for crimes committed in his presence or with his knowledge. If I fail... To, whatever, uh, to do whatever I can do to prevent them, I too am guilty, end quote. So let us consider Jasper's concept in light of the following two passages from Tuck and Yang. So the first one, they write, quote, Settlers are not immigrants. Immigrants are beholden to the indigenous laws and epistemologies of the lands they migrate to. Settlers become the law, supplanting indigenous laws and epistemologies. Therefore, Settler nations are not immigrant nations, end quote. Second, instead, settler colonialism involves, quote, the disruption of indigenous relationships to land, which represents a profound epistemic, ontological, cosmological violence, end quote. This is, I'm glad you did a land acknowledgement, but it's one of those big discussions in indigenous political thought about the purpose of land acknowledgements. Um, where they say, well, what is it that a land acknowledgement does? What, what are we doing when settlers acknowledge it? What is our relationship as if it you know, evacuates the problem of power um, as being present in these kinds of things or colonialism or things like this? So while they're important in some ways, there is also ways in which they can be politically problematic. I would propose that Tuck and Yang describe a kind of existential violence that attacks the core relationships and norms that make an indigenous world Remember, there's plural here, but we could just say, for the singular for the moment, an indigenous world possible. So we could say, for instance, in the Anishinaabe readers that I'm familiar with, because I used to live in Ottawa, so I know a lot of Algonquin political thinkers and Anishinaabe political thinkers, and I've read them, is that they talk quite a bit about the idea of kinship as being central to many of their, you know, the idea we would talk about a world is kinship not only amongst other human beings, but with non-human um, members of the community. Kinship, treaties even, like Leanne Simpson talks about treaties that you would have with what we would just say are animals that couldn't enter into a treaty. And I think that that's very important about the problem in that sense of epistemic, ontological, or cosmological violence. And I wondered initially if something like Jasper's concept of metaphysical guilt could contribute to our sense of settlers for responsibility for the kinds of existential violence, the genocide and forced assimilation that the European invasion committed against and commits against indigenous peoples. Because remember, it's not just in the past. I would say, though, that his concept of metaphysical guilt does not. When he discusses the liability of the collective form of guilt, he explains that this liability includes necessary reparations and possibly the loss of restriction of political power and political rights. Um, and that's in terms of political guilt. By contrast, metaphysical guilt calls an, in an individual before, quote, the jurisdiction that rests with God alone, end quote. And so I've been teaching Franz Fanon this semester, and it turns out that if you read the footnotes to Black Skin, White Masks, Fanon writes, quote, God has nothing to do with the matter unless one wants to clarify this obligation for mankind to feel co-responsible, responsible meaning that the least of my acts involves mankind, end quote. Neither the concept of metaphysical guilt nor political guilt captures exactly how settlers are responsible 
for the ongoing accumulation of guilt, of course, in German is schuld, which is also debt. So the ongoing accumulation of debt. And I think that shift is doing more conceptual work than I wanted to right there, but we only have 20 minutes. So the debt for the existential violence of settler colonialism. Again, the epistemic, ontological, cosmological violence. Settler colonialism cannot be reckoned merely as political debt, if we're going to stick with Jasper's categories, paid via reparations, although, you know, I'm not going to knock reparations as a sense of dealing with these kinds of problems. So while reparations and the return of land to indigenous nations is necessary to reckoning political debt, they do not necessarily speak to the epistemic, ontological, or cosmological violence perpetrated by settler invasion. And metaphysical debt does not seem to capture the problem either, in the sense we could just say, oh, we can account for both, because indigenous philosophers discuss, as they discuss indigenous resurgence, which is the term they use for these discussions, that revitalizes their own epistemic, ontological, and cosmological relations to kin and land. But to categorize resurgence as merely metaphysical or ontological poses two problems. And the first is, it has the potential to reify indigenous social relationships as if they were metaphysical essences outside of history. And anthropology has done a bad job for a very long time just sort of setting up these kinds of discussions like, oh, and here's we go, set, we, we go study this community, and these are the relationships that have been there since time immemorial, et cetera, and they don't have a history. And it's factually incorrect and bad anthropology. Uh, people call it, uh, when they're being negative about it, they say, that's a form of salvage ethnology in the sense that it's trying to salvage what may remain of a community that's in danger because of colonialism, often by depoliticizing these problems. Second, though, back to Jasper's a bit more, I think that Jasper's presumes a degree of spiritual, that is, phil uh, philosophical and theological, homogeneity among those who have wronged others and those who are wronged that we cannot assume when assessing the debts and violence of settler colonialism. These assumptions guide his explanations of the causes of World War II, when he gives undue weight to the idea that the West was gripped by a spiritual crisis exacerbated by technological transformations. I would propose, at least as a counter-narrative to this, to consider um, a narrative of this history that extends outside of the discussion of the West as the locus of this problem and a kind of spiritual crisis that grips it by looking at the way in which racialized thinkers, in the sense of thinkers that we now consider to be core members of the Af Africana tradition or African-American tradition or indigenous tradition, um, uh, have discussed this problem. And I'm going to walk through a bunch of steps very quickly, so just bear with me. It's kind of like a series of quotes as we go backwards in time. It starts with a well-known passage from Aimé Césaire's Discourse on Colonialism, when he contends that fascism, Hitlerism, in his word, took the techniques of colonial oppression, settlerism, and genocide, and turned them against Europe itself. Not to belittle what happened in Europe, but to try to look at its roots in European um, political imperial practice before um, it was turned back against Europe. And he writes, quote, the very distinguished, very humanistic, very Christian bourgeois of the 20th century had tolerated Nazism before it was infl inflicted on them, that they absolved it, shut their eyes to it, legitimized it, because until then, it had been applied only to non-European peoples." End quote. Now, that's post-war. Césaire is not the first, though, to situate fascism in its global context. In Dusk of Dawn, the autobiography of a race concept from 1940, W.E.B. Du Bois contends that fascism arises out of the valorization of whiteness, in American and European imperialism. And he writes, quote, Hitler is the late crude but logical exponent of white world race philosophy since the Con Conference of Berlin in 1884, end quote. The conference which, of course, partitioned Africa amongst European, uh, partitioned Africa into colonial holdings for European nations. In fact, though, Du Bois criticizes this white world race philosophy even earlier in Darkwater, Voices from Within the Veil of 1920, which I take to be a very important text because it's, uh, it's a critique of whiteness that looks both at the, the structure of imperialism and the problems of Jim Crow um, in this short little piece uh, in chapter two called The Souls of White Folk. Um, and it's after World War II in 1920s, finishing it in 1919 is when he signs it, I think. In Darkwater, Du Bois gives a sociogenetic explanation of the emergence of what he calls personal whiteness. 
He argues that personal whiteness is an invention of the late 19th century. Whiteness had been legally codified long before the 19th century. If you look at the history of the United States, you can look at the history of Canada, you can look at settler colonial society in Australia, New Zealand, you can look at various other places. And that whiteness was already legally codified. So personal whiteness has to be something other than merely the legal codification, although the legal codification is important to something. So we can conclude that Du Bois links this invention to the expansion of European imperialism and capitalism, the closure of the frontier in the United States in 1890, you know, the thesis about the closure of the Western frontier. And in fact, um, the, in, you know, the RCMP invasion of what is now British Columbia, in fact, dates from around that time as well in a, in a significant way. Um, the formation of, as many anti-fascist critics talk about it, the proto-fascist Ku Klux Klan, and the implementation of Jim Crow in the United States. And also one last factor is the ma uh, massive immigration by people who were not Anglo-Saxon in the United States as well, and their entrance into what David Rodiger has called the white working class. So all these different things happen at the end of the 19th century, and this is what Du Bois is pointing towards. And he says, what did all these things have in common? He says, when I inquire about what whiteness is, he defines whiteness from this impression as possession. He, uh, he says, quote, I'm quite straight-faced as I ask soberly, but what on earth is whiteness that one should so desire it? Then always, somehow, some way, silently but clearly, I'm given to understand that whiteness is ownership of the earth forever and ever, amen, end quote. So I'm gonna point towards this in the sense where I would say, because I'm looking at the rise of the far right and its relationship to settler colonialism, in Canada specifically, but the United States obviously plays an important part in this formation as well, is that when I look at this kind of stuff, I want to look to what it can tell us for the future. And the, way, the reason why we go back to Du Bois is that many scholars now are talking about similar things about this idea of whiteness and possession. In fact, in that niche that you know, Sakai describes as you know, white settler colonialism and fascism occupy a similar ecological niche in North America. Du Bois is own discussion looks at possession as entitlement. And he says, this is, can be defined very quickly as, quote, the white man's title to certain alleged bequests of the fathers in wage and position, authority and training. And then he says, interestingly, everything considered the title to the universe claimed by white folk is faulty, end quote. And this actually was the moment where I realized that there's a connection to the discussions we have about indigenous rights in Canada and various other things when indigenous political thought talks about it, because they specifically talk about indigenous title claims. Well, what is it that the title claim presents when it's a, a conflict between the crown title claim, which is that of the Canadian government, we call it the crown in case you're not Canadian and you don't, you know, you're not familiar, they say crown title, and then we also say indigenous title, and these things come into conflict. And of course, the problem is that the crown colonial courts, in their view, are the ones resolving it, which means that we get answers that favor the crown, obviously, out of this. And there's a lot of skepticism towards legal mechanisms as resolving these things, which is why they need to say they, there needs to be a political, um, uh, a political resolution to this. But the key point coming out of this is to say, well, then if we're going to assess the debt of ongoing settler colonialism, then in fact there's two parts to this problem that we want to look at that actually bring us right into indigenous critiques of these kinds of problems right now that can stretch back as far back as 1920 and that are brought into the present in a similar discussion of whiteness and settlerism as possession. First is entitlement in the sense of futurity. That in, indeed to even assess these kinds of titles, we make an important or a crucial philosophical decision about, in fact, who has a right to futurity in the sense of entitlement. Whose futures belong? Whose futures do not belong in the, in, in the land that comes into the conflict here? And then the second one is the idea, of course, that title is directly related to the discussions that we have about title to say the relationship between indigenous claims to title and um, uh, crown claims. Um, so I think I'm going to wrap it there, because if I start in the next part of it, then it's just another 20 minutes of trying to explain recent court cases um, in relationship to that. So thank you. I have one question. <clears throat> and I, I, wonder, I wonder if you could explore the notion of 
uh, if I'm understanding the notion of metaphysical violence or metaphysical guilt well. Um, and so I'm, uh, I'm from Thompson Rivers University, which is a Shaquem, um, uh nation. And uh, one of the elders is describing the, the, the problem of interacting with the settlers is that the, the sort of the barriers of the sort of metaphysics of the language in some sense, where there's their, their language or their ways of knowing don't incorporate these broad notions of subject, object, and that they speak more in terms of relations and whatnot. So it is the issue that in some cases we need to be more aware of the fact that when we're trying to address these situations or think about these situations, the terms with which we use are doing a kind of violence to the discussion beforehand. Is that something that is relevant or what are your thoughts on that matter? So that's good because um, it gets to one of the, the biggest problem about trying to talk about, and I actually use it in the book I'm working on too, is this idea of existential violence. I want it to call into to, um, into our minds, the or into our con, like conceptual vocabulary, the idea that there are communities at risk of like something like their survivances in question. That's the word that Gerald Visner, Gerald Visner uses for um, you know indigenous communities um, by virtue of existing as survivants that they prolong like they're 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 preserving a world in a sense of of the kinds of things that you're actually talking about and that may be one of the major issues i have with jaspers in a sense that um subject object distinctions and and narrowing it to something like conscience as between me and god or something like this is a very western way of construing the 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 problem there and i, I found it was really interesting that fanon even brings this up in a certain sense but I think a lot about it in the sense that the big change in my own thinking for these issues was really trying to take seriously the discussions of kinship. And men, I ended up reading a ton of anthropology as part of this as well to say, we don't do kinship in our Western philosophical vocabulary in a way that I think really even comes close to the discussions of kinship and relationality that you would find in indigenous philosophy. And that's a huge problem in trying to say, well, how can we assess the claims that, that indigenous communities make about title if we don't even have, I mean, most of our discussion of property and title and possession, it comes out of lock. And just to say we got lock and kinship, that, I mean, that doesn't work because it's lock, it's possession and contract and, and, and various other aspects that play a major role. Whereas, you know, they, they obviously, when I discuss, I have a co-author that we discuss a lot of this stuff when we get into some of these discussions. And, and he's Algonquin. And, and that's a big major thing where I'm like, look, I. I can even say, when we talk about, for instance, indigenous political thought, that someone like Glenn Sean Coulthard, who you probably are familiar with, at least in name, as a, as a thinker who teaches in the Lower Mainland and stuff, he talks about land and dispossession. And, and it's funny, because when we were talking about Coulthard's work, I turned to my friend, his name is Veldon Coburn. And I said, all this works, but then when we get to the land concept stuff and the kinship stuff, this is where I really know. I still have, you know, there's still a lot of unconscious conceptual categorization that I'm making that just is not looking at the kinship issues. So, I mean, your, your, your points are very important um, in that regard. The difference is the Shaquempic thought now, there's a lot of material coming out by uh, Shaquempic thinkers that sort of tries to address some of these issues. That it raises other issues about, you know, legitimacy of settlers saying, well, I can speak about this in a way that's meaningful. Um, which is a whole other question. Yeah, I find this really interesting. Um, I guess I was wondering at what point is one able to say, well, these conceptions are connected with this completely different way of looking at things. And I guess a further question is, when does one have to draw the line on what counts as a kind of permissible conception or uh, I, I'm I'm struggling here to think about this. I guess the, what I'm uh, thinking about is that um, Kassir actually has a lot of discussion of uh, the way in which uh, a kind of mythic consciousness operates much more at a level of sort of affective social thinking and, and a, a sense of the individual only emerges at a late, but the worry is that that makes it look like, you know, the one is primitive and the other, uh, uh, so I'm kind of a, a, at a loss as to how to think about this, but I really would actually like to hear a lot about this literature in order to get a better sense of how to approach that. 
I like that question too because it speaks to a really important problem um, of European understanding of myth and the way that it's been developed is very different. So I can't say like I know, like I understand, you know, uh, I understand the kind of discussion of you know the narratives and, and myths, the way the elders portray them. I'm not going to lay any claim to understanding the truth of any of these things because there's you know rights of transmission and other things like this that are very important. But I can say where Europeans have gone very wrong in understanding mythology that falls into the issue of trying to portray it as some form of primitivism, is that the one thing I can say I've learned is that understanding um, narratives about myth, ancestors, creation, and the various other stories that Europeans, especially in that period, tried to portray as a sort of mythic beginning leading to individual conscience, is that it completely misses what um, those kinds of stories are supposed to do. Um, many of them are, and again, I'm not going to claim to be able to represent them accurately in the sense of like being able to tell you the content, but I can say that many of them, and our first step towards getting an understanding of this is, and this is why I said we can't ahistoricize them, is that they are historical and they are stories about um, ethical decisions that people make about often the wrong mistake first and the kinds of things that emerge with the wrong mistake and then choices to put things right. And so if we just thought it's like this primitive, you know, consciousness that's present, which was obviously what European and anthropologists and folks from the 19, uh, I mean, very late, much later than the 20s, but I know that's a period of many of the people we're discussing. Um, that's where they, they, they kind of go, oh, well, we have the Greeks, and it goes here, and this is what happens. Um, but it's very different to say in these communities, the stories they tell change over time. And they're, they're malleable because what they do is they respond to contemporary situations about the ethical choice to make. There are some that many of us are familiar with, like many of them, you can think about them as describing wrong choices, rectifying them, and then talking about responsibility to future generations or to ancestors. Um, many of them, in fact, and this is one of the other major ones I encounter even in teaching and talking to students about this, many of them are extremely respectful of individual conscience. and. Um, levels of decision making uh, and, and consensus building that, that make Western ideas of consensus building to be fairly weak in proportion where they'll say something like every individual conscience has to be able to come along or else we don't make a decision that has af uh, effects that lead to X, Y, and Z. 51%, I mean, like you, you people are selling, they'll say you settlers are selling yourself too short at just bringing on 51% and letting the other 49 feel like losers in this, in this story. So I mean, there's quite a bit, you know, when you start uh, engaging with this stuff to try to understand it. There is, there's a really, uh, and we find it, you know, since you're at Thompson Rivers and, and we're both in the Canadian context, is that you know you see when there's even negotiations between uh, First Nations, uh, Métis or Inuit communities and, and the Crown, is that you find it, they represent a lot of frust the Crown represents a lot of frustration at decision making procedures. That I think is really disrespectful in the sense that it doesn't. Even on, they, they're not even trying to understand consensus building according to indigenous tradition. So I think the question about myth is great because it really opens the door to a lot of ways of trying to understand myth and, and narrative and stories very differently. Thank you. That's great. Let's uh, thank our presenter, Dr. Dr. Devin Shaw. Our final speaker for the night is Dr. Joshua Tepley, an associate professor of philosophy at St. Anselm College. <laughs> Dr. Tepley received his PhD in philosophy from the University of Notre Dame in 2013. His dissertation offered an analytic interpretation of Heidegger's uh, philosophy of being in being and time. His current research interests are in 20th century continental philosophy, analytic metaphysics, and the philosophy of mind. Dr. Tepley has several publications in the field of 20th century continental philosophy on Heidegger and Sartre. The title of his presentation is Jaspers on the Question of Free Will. Thank you very much. So over the past decade or so, my research has tried to engage, perhaps futilely, uh, philosophers from the analytic and continental traditions on core metaphysical topics like being and consciousness and freedom. Hitherto, my work on the continental side of the street is focused on Heidegger and Sartre, but for this meeting, uh, I'm extending my research to Carl Jaspers with a special focus on his philosophy of freedom or free will. I'll use those terms more or less interchangeably. There are different strategies that one can adopt in trying to bridge the divide between analytic and continental philosophy. The simplest strategy is probably to offer uh, clear translations of difficult continental uh, works, texts, or ideas using ordinary language, or at least language uh, that's familiar to analytic philosophers. 
The main drawback of this strategy is that even those analytic philosophers who take the time to read these translations are often left wondering why they should care. It isn't, isn't enough to make something comprehensible when also has to show why it matters. It's difficult con to convince people that they should care about something by simply appealing to its intrinsic value. A better strategy, I think, is to show how the thing connects to something the people in question already care about. This will be my strategy then in this paper. Many analytic philosophers uh, care about free will and whether it's compatible with either determinism or indeterminism. Jaspers addresses this in volume two of his massive work, Philosophy. My goal in this paper then is to engage Jaspers with the analytic tradition by articulating what he has to say about this debate. So what is this analytic debate over free will? In a nutshell, the debate is whether free will is compatible with either determinism or indeterminism. It seems to be compatible with neither, from which it follows, since these are jointly exhaustive uh, alternatives, that we don't have free will. Obviously, much hangs on what determinism means here. Sometimes it's defined as the view that everything has a cause or that every event is caused by prior events. The more usual definition nowadays is that it's the view that the past and the laws of nature determine a unique future. In other words, everything that happens must happen given the past and the laws of nature. And indeterminism then is just the denial of that thesis. Far more crucial to this debate is what we mean by free will. According to some philosophers, um, the compatibility of freedom with determinism hangs precisely on what freedom means. The only way to save freedom is to defend a compatibilist definition of it. However, I subscribe to the view, um, defended by Peter Van Emwagen, among others, that this is not the case. Freedom, according to the classical debate, um, can be defined quite simply as the ability to do otherwise. A person acts freely just in case she does something but could have done something else instead. Obviously, philosophers would think that we can save free will from determinism only by offering some other definition of freedom uh, will be displeased. Be that as it may, from here on out, I'm going to simply assume that this is what um, the debate's about in analytic philosophy. That is, whether determinism or indeterminism are compatible with the ability to do otherwise. It's not hard to see why determinism threatens the ability to do otherwise. If everything that happens must happen, given the past and the laws of nature, and I am to control over the dis distant past, say before I was born, or the laws of nature, then how can I have any control over anything that happens right now, including my own actions? The problem with indeterminism is slightly more difficult to see, but here's a very, very, very simple gloss. If what I do is not determined by the past and the laws of nature, then whatever I happen to do seems to be completely random or arbitrary, and randomness is no more compatible with freedom than causal determinism. Okay, that's too fast, but be that as it may. Um, obviously, there's much more to say about these and other arguments, um, but I'll leave this to the side so we can turn to the main focus of this paper, um, what Jaspers has to say about this debate. The most basic assumption of Jaspers' account of freedom is that there are different ideas or concepts or notions of freedom, and not all of them are of equal importance. Jaspers classifies some of these notions as objective, and these are not kinds of freedom that ultimately matter. He gives examples in his uh, work, Philosophy, of three such notions. First, acting without a cause. Second, acting with, uh, without disturbance from the outside. And third, the possession of civil, I'm sorry, a personal civil and political liberty. These kinds of freedom may very well exist or not exist, he says, but their existence or non-existence is not fundamentally important. So why don't these objective notions of freedom ultimately matter? simply because the kind of freedom that does matter, ultimately, what Jaspers calls existential freedom, can't be objectified. So it can't be identified with any of these objective notions. Existential freedom is logically distinct from acting without a cause, acting without disturbance from the outside, and the possession of personal, civil, and political liberty. So what does this have to do with determinism and indeterminism? According to Jaspers, the debate over determinism and indeterminism applies only to objective notions of freedom. And here I have a long quotation from him, which I'll read. So in his words, 
The theses that the will is unfree or free have long been locked in an impassioned battle under the names of determinism and indeterminism. It was as if the human essence might hang on a theoretical decision. When we talk of free will, we are indeed inclined to wish for a display of its objective existence. But freedom is not in existence, and since the supposedly generally valid and demonstrable statements to affirm or deny it would nonetheless objectify its being, they cannot but pervert its meaning. The object with which they leave us is not what freedom was originally all about. Any argument for or against it could apply only to its objective existence. And that's the end quote. So in short, the kind of freedom that ultimately matters, again, existential freedom, is left untouched by any argument based either on determinism or indeterminism. Any notion of freedom that is susceptible to such arguments is necessarily an objective notion, and so not that of existential freedom, which can't be objectified. From this, we can infer what Jaspers would say about the analytic debate about the compatibility um, of the ability to do otherwise uh, with determinism and indeterminism. Since the ability to do otherwise is susceptible to arguments based on determinism and indeterminism, the ability to do otherwise must be an objective kind of freedom. Its existence, or non-existence, is simply irrelevant to the kind of freedom that ultimately matters, existential freedom. The problem with the analytic debate isn't that one side is clearly right, or even that the debate has no solution. The problem is that the analytic debate completely ignores the kind of freedom that really matters, and this kind of freedom is compatible with both determinism and indeterminism. If this is Jasper's view, that the kind of freedom that really matters, existential freedom, is compatible with both determinism and indeterminism, then one would like to know a bit more about it. Immediately we're faced with the problem that this kind of freedom is not objective, and so there are limits to what we can say about it. Jasper says that this kind of freedom is, and these are his, well, the translation, but incomprehensible and can't be known is the translation. However, this does not mean that existential freedom is ineffable. After all, Jasper spends quite some pages talking about it. So while we can't expect perfect clarity, we can hope to learn something about what this kind of freedom is like. Jasper's elucidation of existential freedom proceeds in stages, which get more and more I would say obscure as he goes along, but we can discuss that during the Q&A. Uh, existential freedom seems to comprise various elements, which I'll refer to as layers. The bottom layers are the most objective and so are the easiest to understand. Successive layers are less and less objective, and so Jasper's elucidations of them are less and less clear, I would say. Existential freedom seems to be, as I understand it, the sum total of these layers, the more objective ones at the bottom and the less objective ones on top. So Jasper be begins, this is the first layer, with what he calls freedom as knowledge. Here he makes the, I think, uncontroversial point that freedom requires knowledge of the world, oneself, and one's actions. A stone can't be free for, among other things, it has no awareness of anything. And yet, freedom is more than this. As Jasper puts it, knowledge does not make me free as yet, but without knowledge there is no freedom, end quote. The second layer is what he calls freedom as arbitrary, or sometimes it's, called, it's translated as spontaneous, act. In Jasper's words, quote, knowing I see a realm of my possibilities. I can choose among the several I know. Where several things are possible for me, the cause that will occur is my arbitrary or spontaneous act, end quote. What Jasper's means by the arbitrary act is not entirely clear. Surely it can't mean uncaused act, uncaused act. For earlier, he identifies this as one of the objective notions of freedom, which he says has nothing to do with existential freedom. I think that what he means is this. Whenever we're faced with one or, or sorry, two or more alternative possibilities, we must choose between them. And the choice we make is up to us or under our control. Well, there are a few more layers here, which I will just tell you what they are without, without clarifying them for you. So the third layer is what he says is acting in accord with the law I recognize as binding. The fourth layer he calls freedom as idea. And the fifth layer, which rounds out his picture, is freedom as choice or resolution. So I'm going to skip over the, uh, 
uh, expositions of those so I can get on to the rest of the paper. Um, so I want to go back to the second layer, um, which should remind you of this power to do otherwise, which is how I defined free will, according to the analytic uh, debate. Um, so the second layer of existential freedom, freedom as arbitrary act, seems to resemble the traditional understanding of free will as the power or ability to do otherwise. And here again is the, is the crucial passage. He says, knowing I see a realm of my possibilities, I can choose among the several I know. Where several things are possible for me, the cause that will occur is my arbitrary act. End quote. So could this be then an endorsement of the traditional understanding of free will as the ability to do otherwise? After all, when Jaspers gives three examples of objective notions of freedom, this is not among them. So they're on your handout, there are three of them, but the power to do otherwise is not one of those three. Perhaps then, the ability to do otherwise isn't an objective notion of freedom after all, but actually a constituent of uh, existential freedom. But we mustn't forget why we were, we were led to identify the ability to do otherwise as an objective notion of freedom in the first place. According to Jaspers, determinism and indeterminism have no bearing whatsoever on existential freedom. Existential freedom is compatible with either of these theses. But surely determinism and indeterminism do have some bearing on the ability to do otherwise. After all, there are dozens of arguments and hundreds of papers, literally, arguing that either determinism or indeterminism or both are incompatible with, with, this, with this ability. In short, we seem to be presented with an inconsistent triad, each element of which Jasper seems to endorse. So claim one, determinism and indeterminism are irrelevant to existential freedom. Uh, claim two, existential freedom presupposes the ability to do otherwise. Uh, claim three, determinism and indeterminism are relevant to the ability to do otherwise. So Jaspers cannot consistently at least endorse all three claims, so which of them then does he, de does he deny? And I thought this through, and I think there are different ways of resolving this, 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 uh, this tension in Jaspers, but I think that one way of going is to think about Jaspers as participating in the tradition of phenomenology. So if Jaspers is a phenomenologist, then he has at least, well he actually has two ways out of this trilemma depending on how he understands the function of phenomenology. So phenomenology, putting it very, very crudely, is the careful and systematic study of how things appear. There are two ways of justifying the legitimacy of this philosophical approach. First, one might argue that how things appear is far more interesting and important than how they are in themselves. According to this view, Phenomenology might not be an accurate guide to reality, but that's okay, for appearances are what ultimately matter anyhow. According to the second approach, phenomenology is an accurate guide to uh, reality, and that's why, it's, that's why it matters. In other words, the careful and systematic description of how things appear to us will tell us how things are in themselves. And so, appearances matter, matter because reality matters. Let's call these the weak and the strong uh, understandings or justifications of phenomenology. According to the weak understanding, phenomenology is worth doing because appearances matter in themselves, apart from uh, any light they may or may not shed on the ultimate nature of reality. According to the strong understanding, phenomenology is worth doing because we want to grasp the ultimate nature of reality, and the best way of doing this is by studying the way things appear. So how is this relevant? Well, on the weak reading, Jaspers can be understood as saying that existential freedom requires what appears to be the ability to do otherwise, but this doesn't mean that we actually have this ability. And that's okay, since what really matters is how things appear, not how they are. This response would deny the second claim, too, uh, of the triad. If by the ability to do otherwise is meant a genuine metaphysical ability, then Existential freedom does not require it. What it requires is simply the appearance of this ability. On the strong reading, we know we have the ability to do otherwise because it appears that we do. Remember, on this reading, appearances, properly analyzed, tell us about reality. So we can know through phenomenological reflection that we have this ability, and this ability is required for existential freedom. On this reading, it's the third claim of our triad that's false. 
is false because nothing in the analytic debates can show us that we don't have the ability to do otherwise. If incompatibilism, sorry, if the incompatibilism between free will and determinism can be proven, then we know, we know that determinism must be false. If determinism can be proven true, then we know that it must be compatible with the ability to do otherwise. So here we might draw an analogy with Zeno's paradoxes. So we know that things really do move from one place to another. So any, any argument that they don't must have some flaw, whether we can find it or not. In the same way, phenomenological reflection proved that we have this ability to do otherwise. So any arguments that we don't have this ability must be flawed, whether or not we can find the source of the flaw. Okay, in conclusion. So the main purpose of this paper was to engage Jaspers and analytic philosophy by explaining what Jaspers would say about the analytic debate, about whether free will, understood as the ability to do otherwise, is compatible with either determinism or indeterminism. I have proposed that Jaspers can go in one of two different ways, depending on how he understands the function of phenomenology. Either Jaspers insists that the kind of freedom that really matters, existential freedom, does not require the ability to do otherwise, although it does require the, the appearance of this ability, in which case the analytic debate, while fine as far as it goes, misses the mark. What really matters is existential freedom, and the analytic debate doesn't touch this kind of freedom. The burden of, uh, for Jaspers, in this case, is to explain, one, why existential freedom requires only the appearance of this ability to do otherwise, not the real thing, and two, why existential freedom matters so much more than other kinds of freedom, including the actual ability to do otherwise. Alternatively, Jaspers could argue that we can know for certain that we have this ability to do otherwise, in which case all arguments to the contrary are ultimately pointless except as logical puzzles like Zeno's paradoxes. But this depends on the assumption that uh, phenomenology properly done is an accurate guide to reality. We seem to have the ability to do, what to do otherwise, and so we do have, this, do have this ability. But why I think that's true? How could one convince an analytic philosopher, say, that phenomenology is an accurate guide to reality? Either way, philosophers who wish to make a place for Jaspers at the analytic debate um, have their work cut out for them. All right, thank you. Questions first from our panelists and then from the audience. So is there a univocal sense that could have done otherwise? I think so. I mean, so uh, all I mean by that is that we sometimes find ourselves in a situation where I can do one thing and I can do something else, um, but I can't do both. Right? So I can raise my left hand, I can raise my right hand. Well, I guess I can do both in that case. But I mean, so I, I can raise my left hand and I cannot raise my left hand, um, but I couldn't do both at the same time. And so that's all I mean by that. I just mean that. I mean, I would say that there's a, the, the, the word can is doing all the work here. Yeah, exactly. You seem to be assuming that can has one definite meaning, and you're using that as uh, the, the wedge to uh, get this to work. But uh, there doesn't seem to me to be any good reason to assume that Jaspers accepts that premise of yours or ought to, uh, since his position is precisely that uh, uh, what you're doing, which is to try to map uh, uh, these uh, deliberative situations and their phenomenology onto some sort of strict either or, it's got to be one thing or the other. And, and you do that too with the phenomenology. It's either out there or in here. And um, I mean, these are all uh, assumptions that Jaspers, given his own uh, assumptions, should just reject, right? I mean, they, they're governing assumptions of analytic realism. But uh, what you've shown is that if you assume that kind of analytic realism where something's either this way or that way and there's nothing in between, then you can derive a, a, a problem for, for somebody who doesn't share that conception, but I don't think you've shown anything more than that. So, I mean, of course, um, I want to avoid false dilemmas. That's, that's right. I mean, so at the end, I said, well, there are two ways of looking at phenomenology. I didn't mean that they were um, jointly exhaustive. I mean, here are just two. I mean, so, you know, I wanted to find a way for Yadros out, out of this trilemma. And I thought, well, here's two ways you could do it. Um, so there could be a third way of understanding. Of course, that's true, right? So I'm not saying that if you're a phenomenologist, you accept either A or B. No, there are, could be other options as well. I agree. Um, as far as the, the word can, I mean, I just, I just think that there is a, um, 
a meaning of the word can in ordinary language. And, um, and that's what I was relying on to, to, to um, articulate the core of the analytic debate as I understand it. Um, of course, the authors might say, well, we don't have that power using that sense of can, and that's fine. So then I guess then he would be rejecting uh, two on, on the, um, uh, of the trilemma. So um, unless, yeah, so uh, does that answer your question? So I would think, yeah, I mean, there's an ordinary sense of can, and I'm assuming that, yeah, that's univocal and that we all know what that means. And of course, the authors could say, well, I don't care about that, that power, and that's fine. And then that would be a solution to the problem. But analytic philosophers don't agree about that. And people involved in this debate, you act as if everybody agrees that there's this one univocal sense of can that's relevant to the. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah that's true. Yeah, I agree. But I guess, I mean, so I follow Peter Van Emwegen in this that, there's, there, that there was a classical debate from the 60s to the 80s, where it was about, do we have this power to do otherwise? And it was only after that where people started to say, well, actually, maybe then there's a ki other kinds of free will that are worth wanting, as with, with Dennett's book and so on. But I think I, I'm, what, I'm simplifying things, and I'm saying, look, there was this classical debate um, in the 60s through the 80s, when you know, Ben Omega wrote his book on free will and so on, um, and that's gotten muddled since then. But I think I would argue that that's just, that's just made it, um, that's just muddled the issue. I mean, the debate was about, do we have this power to do otherwise? And then you can pull the bait and switch to say, well, um, who cares about that? Let's talk about if we can get what we want or um, other kinds of things. Um, but there was this core debate, and that's all I'm referring to. So for someone like me, that's the debate that's worth having. And I'm wondering then, fine, I mean, even if there's more than one debate going on, I'm saying, here's this debate, OK? Do we have the power to do otherwise? Does Jasper's weigh in on that? And so if he does, that's interesting. If not, then OK. But um, of course, there are other debates, too. I don't want to pursue this too much, but I mean, my colleague, John Fisher, actually doesn't subscribe. And he's one of the leading people in the field. He doesn't subscribe to your way of uh, defining Ken. That's true. Um, I think he, he's a semi-compatibilist, right? So I mean, if I, if I, I could be wrong. Okay. But I, OK. Anyway, uh, I, I, I don't want to. Put the mic between you and <laughs> Right. <laughs> But I do think there's another question, which is you've got one and uh, three, and you just assume that the sense of irrelevant and relevant uh, are the same. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, ha have you made that out? So is it, have you actually shown that? Uh, I'm sorry, you have to, you're still talking though. Okay. All right. Um, no. So I mean, um, yeah. Uh, if I was going to work something into a longer article, I have to say what much more what I mean by relevant and irrelevant, of course, right? So uh, I agree with that. So I agree. I, be, because I, I was using the word, I meant them to mean you know where irrelevant and relevant are mutually exclusive possibilities. Um, I meant that, but I agree that I have to spell out what that means. So when I say that um, determinism is relevant or irrelevant, irre irrelevant to a certain power, what does that mean? I agree. That requires clarification. Thank you. Yeah. All right, uh, now that we've concluded the presentation portion, we'd like to open up for a general discussion. So first I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Tepley one more time for his excellent presentation. And then I'd also like to uh, have Dr. Tepley stay up here. We'll have all four panelists come up. I think that's probably the best way to do it. My question, I have questions for multiple, but Josh, Joshua, coming back to you, just fast, can you say a little more about the way in which compatibilism doesn't connect with existential freedom? Like what's the incoherence there or, yeah. When we're talking about free will, what are we, talk, what are we talking about, right? So um, obviously there are different ways of going, but one way of going is to say, well, look, we know what freedom is. It's the power to do otherwise. The question is, is that compatible with, with determinism or not? Um, and that, that's what I'm calling the classical debates. And not, ever, not everything thinks that it's not. So um, David Lewis, for example, he thought that uh, free will was the power to do otherwise. And that's actually compatible with, with determinism. So there are compatibilists who accept that definition of, of free will, like David Lewis. Um, it is the case that you can try to be compatibilist by then saying, well, free will is something else. It's not the power to do otherwise. It's like you know, pretty very, very crudely getting what you want, um, or getting what you want provided that no one's you know, forcing you to do that, and so on. So um, of course, compatibilism is just that's the view that uh, free will is compatible with, with determinism. Um, but you can subscribe to what I'm calling, yeah, the traditional definition of free will as the power to do otherwise and be a compatibilist. It's hard, but you can do it. I have a question for Dr. Barrick. I was wondering, um, one of the themes I think in, uh, that came up in your, your talk was the idea of the um, notion of courage when you face your fear, of the fear of death or you confront death, there's a kind of courage there and you kind of, you said something like um, truly know yourself to some degree. There's some kind of knowledge or some kind of, 
um, to be gained by that, having that kind of confrontation or acknowledgement of death. And I was wondering, um, if, I think in something like Heidegger, where it's, we're always at the, in, we're always sort of falling back into the they. So is it, is it when we, what is the sort of, is there a permanency to this kind of confrontation to this knowledge, or is it something that we would, after a confrontation, try and then seek to sort of return away from it and sort of sink back into a non-fearing position, if you want to phrase it that way? Yeah, thank you. That's a good question. Um, I actually have to say I don't know the answer or which answer Yaswars would give. Um, and I think in general, like I, I mentioned some of the questions that um, these, the notion of facing up to a boundary situation um, that, that are raised, right, just by that notion, um, such as like, is it actually necessary for authenticity and so on. And so this would be another good question. And I don't know from the text what he would say. And so he doesn't actually explicitly say something about this. Like, is this like a one-time thing, right, where then you go through this and then you acquire selfhood or authenticity and that's it and then right you have that for the rest of your life um so he doesn't say anything about that um and i think that's a good question though so this one is for kiki as well so you mentioned boundaries and so i'm thinking multiple ways in which boundary situations can occur in someone's life so on one hand you have the boundary situation confronting death where that meets an authentic reaction or confrontation with death but what about the other side of this where you have the boundary situation of radical change in someone's life, and it leads open to the confrontation with death, but not an authentic mode of long living, but suicide. So suicide as the other way of confronting death and affirming it, but in a very different way. I'm just curious maybe how you'd... Thank you. Um, that is also a good question. And I do actually think that he says something about this that now I don't fully remember, but he does talk about this. I think he doesn't explicitly talk about suicide, but he does say there is something about yeah, choosing death that somehow also is not um, like the, the way to go, I think, according to Jaspers. Also within your analytic training then, is this another topic that's not really discussed in some of the analytic fields on these death, meaning, and life things? Or is this really something that you can come on as in your own like reflections or research? Right, yeah. Um, so actually, yeah, so suicide is definitely a topic that, that is discussed. Um, so what I am working on is um, more the relation to, relationship between death and the meaning of life. And so whether the fact that we die deprives life of meaning or is that actually what makes life meaningful? Um, and, and so how does that work? But definitely the question of suicide and whether it's ever like morally permissible, um, whether it's ever rational, um, those are definitely topics that also are being discussed um, in analytic existentialism or sort of also applied ethics. Um, so yes, yeah, so that's definitely a topic that does come up. I have two questions for you. <laughs> Uh, first of all, so you, uh, earlier I said that uh, analytic philosophers care about arguments, and you, I think, very interestingly said that, well, you know, the word argument can mean different things. So uh, I'm wondering, what is an argument, if it's not just a set of propositions, one's the conclusion, the rest are premises that are supposed to support, support the conclusion? Second of all, you said that, uh, that clarity, that different things can be clear, you know, so Kripke's not clear for, for everybody. Um, so actually, the second question is, do you find someone like Heidegger, do you find reading Heidegger, do you find Heidegger to be clear, actually, when you read Heidegger, or not? So those two questions. What's an argument, if not a set of propositions? Um, and then, is Heidegger actually, you find him clear? I, I find Heidegger clearer than the analytic reconstructions of Heidegger. I, I find that they're based on mis fundamental misunderstandings. They don't uh, really understand uh, the... Uh, basis of his thought in uh, neo-Kantianism and in the philosophy of science. So they import uh, prejudices about uh, the philosophical tradition. Is that unclear or just false, though? So it's unclear okay. because what they're doing is interpreting things in terms of distinctions that are alien to. I could give you an example of this in uh, Taylor and Dreyfus's recent book on retrieving uh, realism. They make the argument that Heidegger's conception of um, uh, indexical um, relatedness uh, uh, should be understood in terms of the direct reference theory. 
Now, I find that claim uh, probably absurd, but also uh, philosophically indefensible, since the obvious problem that the direct reference theory has is that it doesn't do what they claim that it can do, namely reach out of language to uh, link up directly with reality. So this is uh, completely philosophically obfuscator, and I'm on the side of um, actually uh, Kuhn, uh, uh, Thomas Kuhn on this, who's usually taken to be an example of obfuscation. Uh, they think that we need to ground scientific developments in this uh, connection to the real world uh, that gives you the bang, right? Yeah. Uh, otherwise, we'll lose touch. And I agree completely with uh, Kuhn that uh, it's only if you think of theory as divorced from its context that you then have to worry about linking it up to the world. So okay. in this picture, you have all of these analytic obfuscations that are based on making assumptions that are uh, institutionally grounded in the way people conceive of things, the stuff outside, the stuff inside. Uh, but those are not uh, plausible philosophical distinctions to make, I would argue. And they're not uh, part of the framework of Jaspers, Heidegger, or uh, uh, Kassir, certainly. And what's an argument? Okay, so the argument... So, the short version. Yeah, the short version of... Uh, okay, so... Um, an argument uh, is a process of reasoning, and it doesn't, uh, it can't consist in a, a set of propositions because those propositions, first of all, are unclear even in their meaning. What is a proposition? Well, how about a statement? Oh, okay, a statement. but uh, the statements have to be uh, connected in a process of reasoning, and that, and this is a fundamental difference between the way uh, thinkers like Jaspers understand logic and the way it's understood in the analytic tradition, they think of logic not as this abstract uh, set of propositions, but the context that gives that set of propositions its differential significance. That's what logic is. It comes from logos. That's a common denominator of all uh, German thought uh, that's not uh, leading up to logical uh, positivism. A and uh, people who are trained in this abstracted, decontextualized conception of an argument are continually helping themselves to uh, uh, the context, but they claim that uh, it's irrelevant. And that's double bookkeeping. Thank you. Okay. I have a question for uh, Dr. Shaw. And um, I was wondering, um, in my introductory reading of uh, Jasper's Reason and Existence, he, he seems to talk about um, or make a connection between truth and communicability. And, and communicability, and he, he seems to set a really high standard for what actually constitutes the communication of truth, where it's sort of like the engagement with these various modes of our own encompassing these kinds of barriers or existential themes. And I was just wondering if, if um, any of those kinds of notions or what kind of uh, Jasper's notion of communication would look like in the context of those kinds of problematic discussions that we would have across, um, say, indigenous peoples and the white person or something like that. Like, he, Jasper seems to set up some conditions on what a communication has to look like. I was wondering if those are applicable. You know, I don't, I don't know Jasper's beyond the, the book that I was talking about. So, but I can say that, uh, at least in terms of like the way in which I would position what I'm talking about in relation to the European tradition, uh, the continental tradition, is that uh, there is a strong, and I don't know if Jasper's counts in this or not, but we could try and place him in here possibly, is I think there's a strong fetishization of uh, language in its originality, in the sense that I, what I'm talking about says, in a lot of ways, we ought to be talking about translation without trying to always look at it as this kind of mourning or nostalgia for an original meaning that gets lost across translation, when I think translation can do a lot of great work. Um, and being mindful and okay with that, knowing that there's going to be um, problems of translation, actually helps us communicate better across traditions quite, uh, quite well, I think.
This question is also for Devin. So Devin, can you just say a little more? Um, I'd, I'd, I'd like to hear a little more. You, you spoke about W.B. Du Bois and uh, kind of some of the relationship that you think that he adds some, some gravitas to this. But can you say, can you connect a little bit more to your theme of guilt um, a little bit more in relation to both uh, whether it's in, indigenous or colonized or a colonizer uh, and, and set settlers as well too? Okay, so I think the idea here is when I said, well, what is the, the debt for ongoing settler colonialism? Um, this arises out of, so there's a, like I said, this was a big move really fast, is that another thing that's going on in this discussion uh, is to say something like, well, if we don't want to just position the far right and fascism as a moment of the past that we're retroactively or retrospectively trying to understand, and then be accountable for, is that what can you be accountable for that may be an emergence of the far right right now? And one of those things is that m part of my work that I obviously could not even get close to getting into here was to say in a lot of ways that's understanding, well, whiteness as possession is something that we can see present in the far right and in fascism, but that is also part of a broader European tradition that we have yet to really untangle and to think. Um, in its formation. And it's it, specifically the personal whiteness part is the part of Du Bois that in some way I would say it unnerves me because it really opens up this category that says we can't just say we can rectify these problems legally. Somehow something about personal whiteness means that there has to be a political solution to this that involves organizing and uh, various other, you know, organizing, conscientization, um, various other things, you know, uh, thinking about the relationship between I whiteness and the ideology of settlerism. And it's really, I think in that way, it really opens the door to a, a huge new, uh, it opens the door to a different way of thinking about many of these problems. And I'm, I'm doing two things by talking about Du Bois. Is first is to say, in a tradition that loves genealogies, that we can say, one of the common things I get is people go, oh, well, people thought differently back then. Well, the importance of a genealogy is always to say, well, there were voices of people who've been pointing this out and that we've missed that history because we haven't been looking for it. But then the second one is to say, of course, it's going to be a recurring problem because it's going to be the same problem of possession that's present both in its legal forms. Um, and there's a lot of research. Uh, Aileen Morton Robinson points it out in Australia, how whiteness is important to understanding who has the right to even possess property. Um, there are Canadian scholars looking at similar problems. Um, just here recently, there was one by Brenna Bandar, who wrote The Colonial Lives of Property, I think is the name of the book, that deals with this. There's people looking at it in the United States that come out of the African-American tradition that is specifically rooted in Du Bois's thought um, when they're making their points of reference. So trying to do a genealogy, trying to also point out a broader political problem that I think is occluded by the way that we traditionally talk about Western political thought and philosophy. Let's uh, thank all of our presenters for the great talk and then uh, we'll wrap up.